So when we think about American finance, we always think of Wall Street. If we don't think of Wall Street, we think of New York. And so if we're talking about all this incredible diversity, how does it converge? How do we bring all these different threads together? And it's important to understand that we are moving from a world of public finance that is driving canals towards a world of private finance that is driving railroads. And so in the 1820s and 1830s, investors, especially from abroad, that look to invest in American bonds, look to invest in public bonds. Because public bonds relied not on these canals to turn a profit, but on the ability of the state to levy taxes, and which is a lot easier than making money. So what we see in the 1830s and 1840s, a transition, a transition towards a world of private finance and a world of railroads. So how does this transition begin in the 1830s, Ed? Yeah, so one of the major targets for bond investment in the 1830s is, of course, the southern states. And European investors snap those bonds up. And those bonds ultimately, while sometimes they're marketed as, as bonds that will support all kinds of infrastructural improvements, most of the money really ultimately goes to buy slaves. And that system, in a way, is almost too successful, as you recall. Uh, the, so many enslaved people are brought to places like Louisiana and Mississippi they produce so much cotton that they drive down the price of cotton. And then the debtors are not, be able, are not able to pay back the banks. The panics of 1837 and 1839 are a large part a result of, of that. And so in the 1830s, you've got a kind of a competition for these streams of uh, incoming um, financial investment, let's call them that. And you've got uh, four competitors, really, New Orleans, Philadelphia, New York, and Boston all struggling to be at the center mm -hmm. of the American financial economy. 1837 and 39 wipe out New Orleans. And at the end of this process, we've got New York. And we also have the failure of the bond merchants in Philadelphia. Yeah. And New York had a lot of things going for it, especially relative to Boston. So that Boston merchants were very focused on safe investments. And like we've talked about before, they were very interested in this small network of what's called the Boston Associates, the elite Bostonians. They didn't like for anything to be public. They didn't want to have to decide things under the watchful eye of the public. They liked to keep things private between themselves, social. This wasn't the case in New York. New York was more market-oriented. It was more open to outsiders. And so the Boston associates who have all the capital in Boston really focus on improving their factories rather than put investing in transportation. Um, they're not comfortable with public stock offerings in a way that New Yorkers and New York mm -hmm. financiers were much more comfortable negotiating at a distance with people, whether in the South or in Britain. Yeah, and so in the wake of 1837 and 39, New York really takes up all of the, uh, the free oxygen that's available, if mm -hmm. you will, with the collapse of New Orleans and Philadelphia banks, and they move straight past Boston and really assert their control. And I think Lewis is absolutely right. New York has always been more open to outsiders than virtually any other city in the world, and certainly uh, more open than 19th century Boston was. So what you see by the end of the 1840s is the development of a stock market in lower Manhattan, on Wall Street, of mm -hmm. course, that really is uh, the, the cornerstone for what ultimately happens. And by the 1850s, you'll have frequent public offerings of railroad company stocks and things like that. And the reason why this exists, why there's so much demand for those New York stocks and New York bonds, is because of what's called the revolutions of 1848. So that the industrialization that's going on across Europe is producing widespread social unrest, especially mm. in the great capital cities of Europe, like Paris. So these Europeans are looking for new places to put their capital that's safe. And lo and behold, they can look to New York City to invest in bonds, invest in stocks. And it's out of this new connection um, with New York City at the, fine, at the center of that European capital begins to move away from investing in southern production, in cotton, in slaves, and begins to be invested instead in railroads, especially western railroads. And so that the early railroads that run north-south, between cities, between factories, begin to look west and start to make those great continental connections. And it's in this moment, even, that you can see that New York capitalists begin to turn their eyes away from the south to the west. And of course, with their investments in another place, those sectional crises that we associate with the 1850s 
that we associate with the coming of the Civil War begin to be apparent and possible. And don't get us wrong, New York is still going to be connected to the South, and European investors and lenders will still be connected as well. But now it's a much more New York-focused kind of investment. Much of the cotton that's made in the South, and this is still over half of U.S. exports in the 1850s, it's still very valuable. But most of that cotton either passes from New Orleans directly through New York Harbor, or in financial form, it passes through there and then passes back again as revenue uh, being sent on towards its producers with the New York lenders taking a nice cut off the top. And all of that investment you're talking about in Western railroads, especially in railroads in the northern part of the West, because almost no southern railroads are built in especially the 1840s. Especially Chicago. I mean, that's especially Chicago, yeah. Uh, that has an effect on the, the sectional crises of the 1850s. Now the North is much more powerful because all that investment is starting to tell. It's starting to make a difference. And so we can see by the 1850s a convergence of American financial system, um, a convergence of practices, a convergence of financial instruments, and a convergence, most importantly, of place in New York City.